Um, so there was some discussion in the chat about uh, some text in the book about lists of booleans, and I have just typed a few of those uh, words in the files so they can look at that later. Uh, there's also now a question about exercise 1.3 and 1.4 about counting values and counting maybes. Uh, so the, the concept of cardinality is not specific to exercise 1.3, but general to mathematics. So, so it's the cardinality that's asked for also in 1.4. It's the same thing. Okay, let's get back to where we were. So remember, we had uh, introduced a complex Im or imaginary unit as one separate data type. And then we introduced two different forms of complex numbers in the data type CB and a show function for it. And then we said, well, actually, um, here are some examples indicating that it's perhaps not very important which form we use. And then saying that, OK, let's just have one form. So plus i is a constructor which takes two real numbers and creates a complex numbers. So this is the real part real part plus imaginary part of the complex number. And then let's continue. Quote five, it's often convenient to represent complex numbers uh, by a single letter. Interesting, well, here we could say that why not double letters? But anyway, W and Z are frequently used for this purpose. And if all of these letters A, B, X, and Y are real numbers, then w is equal to a plus bi and c is equal to x plus yi, then we can refer to the complex numbers w and z. So this is a little bit of a strange mix of syntax and semantics here. So they already told us that a plus bi is the form of a, real, of a complex number. So what they're trying to say here is that, oh, even if it's the form just a name of a variable, it can still be a complex number if it, that variable is called w or z. I think it's a bit overkill to, to have a special naming convention for complex numbers. I think in mathematics throughout, we can always take a single letter name and have a call and say that, well, this w means and then a big expression. So this is not specific to complex numbers. But then comes the last part of this quote. We note that W equals Z if and only if A equals X and B equals Y. So what it's doing here, it's, it's trying to tell us how to implement equality. So it's saying there that equality check taking two complex numbers to a Boolean, equality check if the first one is a plus i, let's see, what was it, a, b, and the other one is a plus i, x, y, then these are equal if and only if, which means that we can check if a equals, or a equals x and b equals y. So this definition implements equality checking. And now it happens to be that this equality check is the default built-in equality check for any data type, uh, saying that just use all the components. So if we would say here deriving not only show by EQ as well, that Haskell would provide us with an equality check. So if we add that line, then we can actually test if um, E1 Oh, sorry, E1 is not a type CC. Uh, so let's, uh, let's make some other numbers. So plus I11, is that equal to plus I0 plus 1, 1 plus 0? And yes, it is. So the real numbers are simplified, and then it checks the quality of the first component with the other one. But it wouldn't be if we changed one of them. OK, so this is basically telling us that we can derive equality for this data type, or we can implement equality ourselves by checking all the components equality. OK, and then it starts introducing the two helper functions, re and im, for getting the real and imaginary part of a complex number. And I will implement these here. 
So here again, we've got a discrepancy between the Haskell rules for syntax and the mathematics rule. I cannot define a function with a capital R. I have to have a lowercase r. And similarly with the i for im. So re and im here are the two functions re and im. And they both take a complex number of type c and return a real number. And if I try to implement something similar to this, so they basically introduce here pattern matching. They say, if we can take the z apart into a real part x and a one, imaginary part y, then returning the x is the implementation of the re function. And there is a notation in Haskell, which is perhaps a little obscure and not very often used, but we can do exactly this. So the real part of z, where this at sign says z is actually of the form plus i, x, and y. So this, this left-hand side, left hand side binds z, x, and y. So that binds the three variables z, x, and y. z to the whole complex number, x and y to the two components. And then actually on the right hand side here, only x is used. Right hand side only well, uses one. And similarly here, it also binds three variables, but it only uses one. We could, for example, write an underscore there. Uh, that would still, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, an underscore in the other position. Uh, so it doesn't really need the name uh, for X. And also we don't have to have, if I comment this one out, uh, we don't have to name the Z here. We can, go just as well, just uh, implementing it in this way. But I'm just doing this implementation to show the similarity with the mathematical text. Okay, and then a little further down on there, this appendix, they define um, sum and difference of complex numbers using pattern matching. So they use a text for this mat matching. So they say, if W happens to be of this form and Z of this form, then we can define addition in this way, addition of two complex numbers. So if we would do it as they do it here, then we would say, well, it's W, whoops. Sorry, I started over typing here. So W plus Z plus Z is equal. Well, here we see that it should be the constructor plus I, because that's the only constructor of the data type. Um, and then it should have two things. One should be A plus X, and the other should be B plus Y. That's just copying what it says here in the quotes. But then the question, how do we get hold of the A and B? Well, we can use the syntax um, that we introduced up here for the matching. So we can say a W, by the way, why do I have three CC, not just CC to CC? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. So CC takes as an argument one W. So let's see, comment here. This is W, this is Z, and this is the result. So the type of the function add CC is a function taking two arguments and returning one thing. So that's the three CCs, two as input, one as output. Okay, so W here uh, is, so we can, we can do it in two ways. Let's, let's tag one way first. So W here should be a constructor plus I, A, B, and Z should be a constructor plus I, x, y. Let's see if this, yes, this checks. And we can try to add c of plus, uh, plus i11, one, one, plus i23. OK, now it complains, add c. Oh, it was called add cc. OK, so that adds up 1 plus 2 is 3, and 1 plus 3 is 4. So this is one way of writing it. 
the alternative way of writing it, uh, let's call this one add cc prime, is you using a where clause, a local definition saying that, oh, by the way, uh, plus i a b should be matched to w and plus i x y should be matched to z. So this, um, this add cc prime will do just the same as add cc. It's just another way of, of writing it. And this, this second way is perhaps a little closer to the text because here in the text, in the definition of plus, you don't see lots of garbage around w and z. That's like a side comment. And similarly here, there's a side comment with the where. Couldn't we also use the re and im functions that you, oh, yeah, sure. Let's, let's make a, a double prime, add cc double prime here. Uh, and then, well, we could do it in several different ways, but let's, let's do it. Uh, maybe it's a long way, but uh, that's, this is the real part of W. This is the imaginary part of W. And you might imagine what's coming here. X is the real part of Z. And Y is the imaginary part of Z. So that's also doing the same thing. Perhaps uh, lining this up would help. Why do we use CC now and not CB? Well, um, what, what we noticed up here, so we, we wrote CA and CB as sort of we were on the way towards an implementation of complex numbers. And the, the knowledge we had at this point did not tell us that C, that plus one and plus two were actually the same. But we later learned from basically this quote uh, that either form is acceptable, that they actually are not only acceptable by the same. And if they are the same, then it would be silly to have two different constructors for them. But clearly, if we want to work with the type CB, then we would have a more advanced addition function because we would have to have two different cases for both. And in that case, so <laughs> I could say here, if we used CB, then the im plus re version would be better because then the re and im could take care of the handling of the two different ways of, of defining complex numbers. And then you wouldn't have to care about that here. Um, so that's, that's an interesting aspect as well. But now, but basically the CB version was a throwaway version, which is now superseded by CC. Why do we not need to declare the types in add CC prime? Yeah, actually Haskell rarely requires to be to declare the types. It's useful so we can, we can add it here. Uh, well, let's let's first before adding it, let's comment it out and ask Haskell what is the type of add cc prime. So it already knows it has this type. There is no choice because of the way uh, we're using the constructors plus i here means that there is and and the rules of the Haskell game that you can only have the same constructor name in one data type uh, in the same module at least. Uh, that means that it can infer this type. And similarly for add, um, add cc double prime, it also has the same type. Uh, I, I still like to add the types. Now I wasn't, uh, didn't pay attention to, to make sure that my intention is mirrored. So then I can get help from Taskle to check uh, that the typing is actually the one I intended. Anyway, now we've, I think we've done in, basically enough on the semantic side. So this is defining and making fun of an appendix. Uh, now let's move to um, complex numbers expressions instead. So, so far we basically did not defined what a complex number really is, what it means, what its semantics is. And I say here an in Cartesian form, uh, let's see if I can get rid of this first half. In Cartesian form, meaning that we got the real and imaginary parts as part of the representation. There is also a complex uh, number representation using polar form. So having the radius or the absolute value and the angle. And that's 
uh, it quite, uh, I mean, for some applications, it's more convenient and some applications, it's less convenient. So, uh, but anyway, this, this implementation was in Cartesian form, but let's now try to move to defining syntactic complex number expressions to define a domain specific language. And as usual, a DSL, there should be three parts. I said four parts in the previous lecture, but I also said that the first or the zeroth part, we will really not talk about much. The sort of surface syntax, the text syntax, which strings should be parsed to this. We're starting from the abstract syntax and then it's three parts. So an abstract syntax type, a semantic type, and an evaluator. And if we now fix our semantic type to CC, basically a pair of real numbers, then we need to then find what the syntax type should be and what the evaluator should do. So let's say that we want to do addition, multiplication of complex numbers, and that we want to include um, constants, real constants, R con is for real constants as complex numbers, and we want to be able to model uh, an I, so the, the imaginary unit. So now notice the types here. Um, there is CE everywhere. And perhaps I should write this type in also the, the other format. There are two ways of writing Haskell data types. Um, add CE, CE. So these two ways will give the exact same result. Uh, there are some pros and cons. Uh, this was now R, con on the real, and this is I. So this, these two definitions of the data type CE are equivalent. I will introduce the same uh, data type and the same constructors in both cases. So notice it's a recursive data type. It has two recursive constructors and it has two base cases or so leaves. And uh, I want to implement an eval function that takes this CE data type into a CC data type that we defined a bit above. And then I can start by saying, okay, I need a case for add, one for mol, one for rcon, and one for i. And I've started filling in this skeleton and I've, I'm using a pattern which I use, we call wishful thinking here. So I'm, I'm trying to say, okay, I will definitely need to handle all cases. And let's assume that all the other cases are solved when I implement one of them. That's the wishful thinking part. So, so far it just says error. So I can't really do anything here, but I can check its type. What is the type of eval? Well, it's, 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 it's the type that I declared it to be. Um, now, the, the, the second step of the wishful thinking pattern here is uh, after having made these patterns to say, okay, what, what do we need to do? Well, we need to implement addition on the semantic side. And here, I think we should switch to the Jamboard a little bit um, to try to illustrate this. I think it's easier to illustrate this graphically. So uh, we have some constructors. So we have... Uh, Let's see how to write it. Um, so we had, I just switch briefly back to see what called, it was called add, yes. So add takes a CE to CE to CE. But we also want to have uh, an addition for complex numbers on the other side which takes CC to CC to CC. So this is the, the two side, this is syntax. And this is semantics. And the eval function is trying to get us from one side to the other. Eval. So, um, we will, as building blocks in the semantic function, uh, semantics function eval, we will use a way, oops, now I'm, I'm drawing 
that I wanted to circle. So we, we need a way to add up complex numbers on the semantic side. Okay, can you try to do a brief summary of the meaning of the semantic side and syntax in the DSL? Yes. So by implementing this, I think those things will be reasonably clear. Uh, so this function add here, we've already seen that what it's doing, I can write it down here, add cc um, of plus i a b and plus i x y is equal plus i a plus x b plus y. So this is working with sort of real complex numbers. <laughs> so real is a strange word here, but things which are uh, built up from one real part and one imaginary part. These are not syntax trees. It really is a pair of real numbers. Here, on the other hand, the CE data type, that's something like addition of R con one and I. That's a syntax tree. This has type CE. So the syntax tree is a recursive data type, which has addition, multiplication, and constants, and the I, while the semantic side only has one shape. A value of type CC is always of the shape plus I of two numbers, real numbers. Uh, more complex, but could we make C an instance of num? I guess I don't really understand the definition of the DSL. Uh, yes, we can make it an instance of them. It's maybe not a law abiding implementation, but we can. And we can see that uh, slightly later. So what I want to illustrate here is the sort of the overview, and then we can get it more concrete by actually doing the implementation. So add CC, we have already defined, but we also need, but and, it, and as we have that defined, I could see, say here, this is add cc of, well, it's not x and y. No, because x has type ce, not cc. So this is a syntax tree, ce for c expression, complex expression. And I need to have a value. So how do I get a value of type cc to add? Any suggestion? Evalex, yes. So I, I could write, it was another suggestion saying CC, X, Y, but that would also not be correct because X and Y are not real numbers. X and Y here, X and Y both have type CE. They are subtrees in the syntax. So the add constructor takes two CE trees and creates a bigger tree. Okay, so see the other suggestion was eval. So eval of X. So if I recursively call, that's the wishful thinking here. Uh, call eval recursively on subtrees. So every time we run into a subtree, we call recursively. Yeah, so what is meant by R con? We will get to that very soon because we will implement it, but let's finish the add for case first. So eval x is the first argument and eval y is the second. So let's see if we try to run, load this. Yeah, it's type correct, but so far we don't have a base case. So we have a case for a recursive constructor add, but nothing else. So let's move to R con. So what is the meaning? Well, it's not obvious. I mean, the, the, what is typical for syntax trees is that they don't really have a meaning in themselves. So a syntax tree must be assigned a meaning, a semantics by our function. But the intention of me here is to embed the real number as a complex number. So if I have a real number five, I want to be able to treat that as a complex number. 
So R con five is the complex number, which has the value five. And so real, real part five in imaginary part is zero. So this here should do something. Uh, and I will, it's, it's a simple definition, but I will still, yes, R con and, R and I are leaves in the data type, yes. Um, they are both leaves. Uh, I will in, implement a small helper function called R con cc and give the r as an argument to it. So this is the real number we have. Notice it's not eval, so not eval r because r is not of type c. What was the definition of cc? Yes, let's split here to see cc. This is the data type CC. So it's basically a pair of two real numbers. It has a plus I constructor with two real numbers in it. And if I now uh, move this line a little bit further up, then we can still con continue with lots of space down here and still see it. Thanks for the splicing in the chat. So anyway, R con CC. Uh, Let's see what R con should do. It should take a real number to a complex number. R con CC, R equal. And then we don't have much choice. So every data type, every value of the data type CC must be of the form plus I something something. So what is the two somethings? What are the two uh, arguments to the constructor if we want to implement this? as intended. R and zero. Yes, the real part is R and the imaginary part is zero. Exactly. Let's try to load this. OK, something wrong. R con is already defined. Where is R con defined? Oh, oh OK. I, <laughs> I apparently had forgotten that I have already defined it. <laughs> OK, um, R con has i and the zero and i will now not to spend too much time on it i will do the same here i will say okay we need a complex number representing i and it's of type cc and i've already implemented here so let's just oops uh, splice it in at the right place so r con and i cc and then let's look at multiplication afterwards so this is the real part zero, imaginary part one. So at this point, the example we had in the Jamboard, if I briefly switch to that one, the addition of R con one and I should be possible to evaluate. So let's do it. So first let's give it a name. Uh, I think I used E1 to E4 up there. So let's say E5. It should be a CE, and E5 should be an addition of an R con 1 to I. OK, E5 is, is type correct. Uh, it's, well, <laughs> it's that's type CE. What happens if I evaluate it? OK, then we get plus I 1, 1. So the, the R con 1 here will be a 1, 0. And the i will be a 0, 1. And the addition operation that we defined earlier, actually, I can perhaps make that also fit. Or I can split it even one more time. Let's see, this is getting tricky. Uh, plus, no, it was called add cc. OK, you can see here, it will add up the component one and zero and zero and one, and it will get us the one one result at, at the end here. Okay, so the only thing remaining is the multiplication of complex numbers. And I'll return to that. Just first, let's see, we want, we want to see the shape of it. So it should take two complex numbers and return a complex numbers, which means this is sort of type driven development. This has to be of the form plus i a b, and this has to be of the form plus i x y. 
the result has to be of the form plus i something something. Let's call it the r, r and well, r and i is perhaps confusing. Um, real and imag, where real equals error to do, and similarly imag is error to do. Whoops. Now at least I got a skeleton in place with what should be done. I just have to figure out what the real and imaginary parts should be doing. So let's do that on the Jamboard. I will actually uh, make an empty page here. So we want to, now I'll do it in mathematical notation. So we want to, we want to multiply A plus IB with X plus YI. And instead of having to remember lots of things about complex numbers, let's, let's just treat this. Uh, so treat this, whoops, as a polynomial in I. So not in X. X is not the polynomial variable here. I is. So let's just multiply these two first degree polynomials. We'll get all the four combinations. So it will be A times X plus a times i y plus i b times x plus i b times i y. Whoops. Yes, I, I also know what the answer is. I just want to show uh, one way of getting to it. So I, here I just did the normal algebraic rules. I multiplied the parentheses. I got four different terms. And now let's collect uh, the terms. So I will also not write out the multiplication of single variables. So it's AX, it's plus I times, and now I will collect the two middle terms, AY plus BX. So here I'm, I'm identifying that I got an I multiplier in both of those. And I got an I squared B Y. And now the only thing I need to know is that I squared is actually minus one. So I can write this one more step. I cannot say that it's like, this is a like AX minus B Y. And that has collected this term and this term. And then the rest is plus i times a y plus b x. So I treat it as a polynomial in i plus i squared equals minus one. Okay, and now we already, um, yeah, so, so there was a suggestion here, maybe I should be easier to say real un equals undefined instead of real equals error to do. Let's move back to the, the Haskell code here. So actually uh, I would say mul cc colon real or something like that. So the, the thing is it's uh, when, when you write undefined, uh, you will get a very unhelpful error message. Uh, but if you actually write something yourself, you will be reminded of where you went wrong. Anyway. So real here, uh, whoa, now something strange happened. I happened to press the wrong button. Oops, back to... Uh, so the real part here, uh, now we've, we've implemented it on the uh, Jamboard and it, it became A times X minus B times Y for the real part and A times Y plus B times X 
for the imaginary part. Okay, so now we have a definition of, uh, oops, that was a little too far, uh, a definition of the whole eval function for all the four constructors. It means that we should now be able to test it for a little more complicated expressions. Um, so let's do eval of E5 times E5. Okay. No instance for num CE. Yes, I was a bit eager here. I wrote the multiplication operator when I should write mul. Okay, I haven't reloaded perhaps. Oops. Okay, still to do eval mul. Ah, <laughs> you see, here I got the reminder saying I haven't implemented the mul case yet because. I have implemented the helper function mul cc, but I haven't actually used it. But now I have. Okay, so apparently e5 squared is real part zero, imaginary part two. So let's think about this uh, a moment. So uh, e5 squared equals 2i. So that, that means that actually um, we've basically implemented the square root of i here as e5, not quite, the square root of 2i. Uh, so this is actually equal to skurt 2i the square root of 2i. I don't have the, <laughs> the notation here in the text mode to, to write the square root, but. So that was a little fun. Um, and syntactically, I mean, any expression I can form using these four constructors, I can now evaluate to just the real part and the imaginary part. And uh, similar to the exercise session on, on Tuesday, of course, you could add variables to this, uh, this language and you could do more other things as well like division and so on but this is uh, sufficient for for this uh, for this illustration so let's just uh, try to summarize a little bit what we've done so we have implemented i think i'm back down to w1.org the overview uh, we expanded a number, number system from n to z to q to real to complex. And we did a very active reading of the math, well, mathematical text defined in complex numbers, uh, modeling several different versions of this in Haskell, including a DSL uh, of uh, complex number. So eval, this was the order. Uh, and we have indirectly talked a little bit of DSLs of types in Haskell, not that much actually. So I think we should return to the live coding and talk a little bit more about types because there are different ways of defining types. And we've seen some of them, basically the last line here, but we haven't seen the others. So back to the live code mode and scroll down and use here types in Haskell. So this is all defined in rather more detail in chapter one, but there are, we've seen a constructor here uh, called data for syntax trees. And the simplest examples of data types is now I will simulate the Boolean type. I will say data boo, it's true or it's false. False. <laughs> I, I can't use the same names without hiding the prelude because it's already defined there. But this is a data type. Uh, if I ask for the information about bool, it says it's a data type with two constructors, true and false. So this is the simplest kind of case. You can also have a day of week equals Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah, well, <laughs> let's, let's just write them out. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, as you might imagine, 
the day or week data type then has these seven constructors. So this is the simplest form of a data declaration. And if you want to write a function from any of these types, you just have to make one case for each constructor. Okay, the, the next step that you can do, so this was like the, the first stage and then add parameters. So data um, foo of A is either um, high A or ho A A. So then, now let's implement a function from foo A to, well, foo A. So what is a function from this foo data type, what does it have to do? Well, it has to cover two cases high of x and whoops who of ho of x and y so these are the two uh, possibilities of a data type or of a function on this data type and then yeah, well, it's not quite obvious what you should do but let's let's just say that it's uh, having fun with this uh, these things it's sort of high x translates to ho of x and x and then ho of x and y throws the base the x and returns high of x just just as an example are you writing semantics now well now i i wouldn't say i'm writing semantics or or, or at least not semantics of something i know i'm just illustrating uh, the haskell ways of making data types so this is a tool for writing syntax trees or semantics, but it's not right now a semantics of anything. Uh, it's a way, it, I'm just showing the, the tools of the trade, the things you can use when you uh, want to model something using data types in Haskell. So not really semantics. Uh, I mean, there could be something which has this as a semantics. And, but let's take something which is the semantically useful then. So data may be, so I just call it may here, or option is the usual common name. So option A is either nope or yes A. So A is a, a parameter of the data type foo, yes. Uh, A is a type parameter to the data type foo A. Yeah. <laughs> nope, yes, yes, it could be none and some, if that's wanted, none and some A. Some sounds like it should be more than one, but anyway. So this is another data type uh, available in many languages, clearly, uh, we, which is semantically useful when you have functions where you're not quite sure uh, what you should return. So for example, division, um, if you divide, say, two ints, then you could say it's option int as a result. Or maybe int is a bad, Let, let's uh, replace int by real here. Whoa, not react, real. So if you divide x by zero, you say none. And if you divide x by some other y, then it's some x divided by y, whoops, Wait. colon r, okay. So this is uh, showing the use of the polymorphic, the parameterized data type option A, where the A was a real. And uh, this, this is um, useful sometimes when you want the semantics to be possible to capture some kind of failure. This is a rather anonymous failure. So it might be that you want another um, data type, which is called, usually called either, but let's be uh, left A or right left. I'm, I'm having to, to uh, change the names here because otherwise it would clash with some predefined Haskell data types. But this data type could also be used for the division x zero equals left um, div 
by zero. And then div prime would have type real, whoops, to real to either string or real. And div prime x, y would be right x divided by y. This would be similar to the option data type. Now it couldn't quite match this. Um, somebody probably sees the error. Couldn't match the type either. Oh, sorry, I, I, I wrote right automatically here. Okay, so this is a, a version of the, of the option type where you can actually also have some data in the error case. This left a corresponds to none. Ja, antingen AB, Erik med höger, A, vänster B, that's uh, similarly. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, we've run out of time for today, but you've seen that we can uh, make fun of an abstract, of an appendix of a math book and implement the Haskell data type corresponding to real numbers, both semantically and syntactically. And we've used on the way some different constructors and data type, ways of building data types. And um, that's all for today. And let's um, meet tomorrow for the exercise session. Bye.